Greetings and shalom from Israel. We'd like to welcome you now to our weekly live stream entitled Midnight from Jerusalem. And we're going to begin with a call to worship. So take out your Bible and look with me to Psalm 77. And we're going to look at, in the Hebrew text, verse 2, but in most English Bibles, it's verse 1. So Psalm 77 and the first verse. I'll read it in Hebrew initially, and then we'll translate it into English. Koli el Elohim ve'etzaka. Koli el Elohim ve'hazin elai. Now, twice in this verse, we see the same phrase. Koli el Elohim, which means my voice to God. And it speaks of one crying out unto the living God. And there's good news at the end of this verse, but let's read exactly what it says. My voice is to God. I have cried out. My voice is unto God. And here's the good news. Vehazin Allah, and he heard me. Now, this word for hearing or listening, it is derived from the same Hebrew word as ear. And in order for someone to hear in this fashion, it implies the nuance of this word was for one to put something in the ear, meaning to approach, to draw close, and therefore this hearing, this listening, has within its context that of intimacy, being close with God. And God, he hears, he listens, he responds, and his utmost purpose for doing so is that we would experience his presence in our life. Well, let's move on to another portion of Scripture from the book of Deuteronomy and chapter 6. And as you turn there, I want to make one brief announcement, and that is next week. I'm speaking about January 17th. It's a Sunday, New York time, 6 p.m. We are going to have our Spanish conference. It's going to be looking at the life, the end of the life especially, of a king, a king of Judah, by the name of Asa. And even though this king, he demonstrated faith repeatedly in his life. He applied the truth of God to many situations. Unfortunately, he did not end faithfully. And the primary purpose of this conference is so that we would be encouraged to persevere, to endure, to not to take our eyes off biblical instruction, but rely upon God so that we can finish faithfully. So the conference is all in Spanish. I'd like to thank Joseph Rivera and his wife Carrie for overseeing this. And for Einstein Guzman for doing all the production, that means the voiceover and producing everything and bringing it together. We're grateful for both of these men and their wives. And also for George Popa, who is our Eastern Europe director, for he is handling the technology and, and making sure that it's going to appear both on our, our website as our weekly live stream, our Facebook, and also our YouTube channel, but also, also on our Spanish faith, Facebook page and our Spanish YouTube channel. So everything's going to be in Spanish, and we're grateful because just recently, some of our most watched videos are Spanish versions. We put out three Spanish videos each week, and they're available on our Spanish app, 
also on many of our platforms, including YouTube, but also each week on Enlace, which is in North, Central, and South America, TBN's flagship station in Spanish. So if you live in Central America, South America, North America, you have access to Enlace, and we have our weekly television program that airs twice. And not only on Enlace, but also throughout Europe, primarily in Spain, on TBN España. So we are investing a lot of effort, time, and such in order to get our teaching into the Spanish community, and the response has been very encouraging, growing rapidly. And we give God thanks and also those individuals that I mentioned. Also in our conference, we are going to be partnering for our worship time with a friend of ours, Carlos Perdoma, and he's going to be sharing some times of worship. So if you speak Spanish or you know someone who speaks Spanish, please invite them. Next Sunday, January 17th at 6 p.m. New York time. Now let's move into our statement of faith from Deuteronomy 6, beginning with verse 4 and concluding with verse 9, the Shema. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Baruch Shem Kavod, Machuto Leolam, Vaed. Via Hafta et Adonai Elohecha, Beho Levavcha, Uvako Napshecha, Uvako Meodecha. Vehayu Hadvarim Ha Ele Asher Anoki Mitzavcha Hayom Al Leva Vecha. Veshina Netam Levanecha, Ve de Bartam Bam, Be Shiftecha, Be Vetecha, Uvlektecha, Vederk, Ukshak Becha, Ukomecha. Ukshartam le ot al yadecha, vehayu le totefot ben anecha, uftaftam al mezizopetecha, uvisharecha. And now let us move into a time of prayer. O Lord our God, God of Avram Yitzchak and Yaakov, God of our Messiah, Lord, we, we praise you. We, we come before you in this time of prayer to worship you, to give you thanks, to offer up our adoration to you with a sacrifice of our lips. Lord, for you are good and there is no other. We, we thank you for salvation, the forgiveness of sins, for your spirit that you have placed within us, that you have promised never to remove. And Lord, we, we want him to guide us, direct us, to teach us, to lead us into all righteousness. Father, we want to be used by you. So Father, we pray tonight that we might have eyes that see, ears that hear, legs that walk in the midst of your will. Lord, open our eyes. Open our hearts to those who are hurting, those who are having problems that we might help. We know that you will provide the resources so that ministry can be done, lives can be touched, and lives can be changed eternally. Lord, we, we come before you praying for those who are hurting, those who are ill, those who are approaching death, those who are struggling with, with upcoming grief and sorrow, those who are currently grieving the loss of their loved ones. Lord, we ask that by your Spirit and by your people that these individuals might be helped, encouraged, uplifted, and, and placed, placed within your love. For, Father, only you truly can be that comforter. God, we, we look to you for, for the leadership of our life, that we might, we might follow, follow where you are taking us, that we might have an excitement to serve you, knowing that as we trust and depend upon you, we, we are brought closer into intimacy with you, that we will be living in your presence 
and we will see the supernatural provision that you give your people in order to accomplish your will. Lord, we thank you for the forgiveness of sins that we have, that important assurance that you will not remember our sins anymore, that we can have a, a confidence not based upon ourselves or our works, but based upon the sufficiency of the cross, that we will be in your kingdom, that you will receive us, that where you are, we will be forever and ever. Lord, with you is good news. We pray for, for the nation of Israel. We pray for other countries that, that your grace will be proclaimed, experience, and your grace will take hold of people's life, moving them in your program, your purposes, your will. Lord, all these things we bring before you, prayers of intercession, prayers of thanksgiving, prayers of petitioning you to help. And we know your love which abides, your love which is strong, and Lord, we, we know that you will move in our midst. So all these things, we give you thanks in the blessed name of our Lord and Savior, Messiah Yeshua. Amen. What we're going to study in this message is one, in my opinion, of the basic but one of the most important truths that we need to understand. And sadly today, few believers do. We do not value what we have received from God through our salvation experience, through being regenerated into a new creation, whereby, and don't miss this, whereby we become a temple of the Holy Spirit and therefore able to manifest God's glory. Take out your Bible and look with me to 2 Corinthians and chapter 3. Paul's second epistle to Corinth and chapter 3. Now, we began this chapter last week and God willing will complete it in this study. And we've seen that there is an emphasis upon the glory of God. Not just God's past glory that was manifested, for example, in the Torah, in the law, the covenant that, that Moses gave the people. There was a glory to that, but there is a greater glory. That glory of the past, of the law, that glory, Paul says, the writer of Hebrew says, it is fading away it is lessening it is going to become obsolete now it has not already become obsolete but it's going to be it is going to be and is for believers even overshadowed with the glory that we can reflect because it is the spirit of god he dwells in us this is the outcome of this covenant of redemption, which we call the Brit Chadasha, the new covenant. This is, as I said, foundational. We need to understand who we are in Messiah, what that new covenant has made us into. And this is what Paul is going to emphasize in the second half of chapter 3. Now, before we begin, we're going to encounter a word. We saw it twice last week, and we'll see it two more times this week. And I mention it, I want to use the, the Greek term, kat argeo. Now, this is a word, it's translated in a variety of ways. Sometimes it's a word abolished or destroyed, and that really is not accurate. That is bringing a wrong view to the text. It's what we said last week. That which is becoming less. That which is fading away. That which is becoming obsolete. What it speaks of is something. 
that although it exists currently, it's been overshadowed. It still has relevancy, but there is something that is greater and eventually this will be no more. But what overshadows it will be eternal. Now, one way, and this is a, a silly way, but it gets one aspect, and I want to emphasize just one aspect of this word. If, if someone gave you, for example, a certificate for 20% off of some purchase, well, that has relevance. It has meaning. But if someone else gave you and said that it becomes free, which would you use? Which would be more superior? Obviously, the certificate that gives you that same thing, not for a 20% discount, but for free. It has a greater glory. Now, the 20% off still has relevance. We learn from that. We can understand that, but something greater has come. Not only does the first one lessen the costs, but what comes totally removes the costs. It gives us an absolute access through this certificate that before that other certificate only reduced the costs. This is what Paul is saying to, and I want you to hear this to some degree. That what was has been overshadowed, and because of that which is coming in its fullness, that which was will eventually, and that's a key word, eventually be no more. It has not been abolished. It has not been destroyed, but, but it will be in the future. Now, its truth is eternal, but its status is temporary. Let's begin. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and we're going to begin in verse 12. Now, the words here, they're not difficult in vocabulary. The grammar is very clear, but once again, one of the things that make 2 Corinthians difficult is that Paul writes in kind of a, a choppy manner simply putting down the main points, but oftentimes how to join them is, is somewhat difficult when we translate them into another language. He says in verse 12, Therefore, based upon what he has already taught in this chapter. Now, one of the good things is this. If you missed last week, you're going to see that Paul is going to take much of what he shared in the first half of chapter 3, and he's going to bring it into the last part of this same chapter. So we don't have to guess. We don't have to, to think, what does he mean? He's going to tell us exactly what he means. Verse 12, therefore having... And this word having is in the present tense. It means that it is a current reality. If you, and hear this carefully, if you are a believer, a disciple of Yeshua, this is relevant for you. This is your reality. So he writes here, therefore, having such a hope. Now, he's emphasizing the fact that we have a very unique, a particular hope. And as I say over and over, biblically speaking, that word hope does not originate in, in my desire, what I want to be. I, I hope for. This has nothing to do with me. This hope is always connected to the promises of God. Our expectations, our hope, is always founded upon what God has said, what he has promised. So it's in that light that we read these words. Therefore, having such a hope, 
And because of this hope in the promises of God, that what God has said is going to be a reality, and that's basically what he's saying. What God has said, his promises, are indeed going to be my reality. That is good news. And therefore, because of that, notice what he says in the second part of verse 12, much more boldly. Now, it's a word much, and the word for confidence, that which is bold, that which we would say, frankly, he's speaking about things that relate to a sure confidence and absolute assurance that he has. And therefore, he says, and this word for boldly or confidently usually relates to not just a, a thought that we have, but rather the speech that we share. So many translations, and I would agree with them, they add a word because of the, the intent of this word. It's a boldness that is not held within, just thought about, realized, but it's one that is shared audibly, verbally. So much more do, do we speak, speak, and it says we utilize this boldness. We, we, we put use to this boldness. So Paul is saying that which we believe, that which we know, we are going to be bold in our speech in order to utilize it for the purpose of God. Read now in verse 13. And even as Moses, or not as Moses, I want to say that correctly, and not as Moses set a veil upon his own face. Now, we talked about this last week. We see this biblically. Moses, he was the mediator, the agent between God and Israel. And he mediated the law, the commandments. And because of the glory of the law, I want to say that. See, the problem is that many places where our faith is supposedly received and believed and acted upon, they, they look at the law with, with a sense of, of condemnation, that it's bad, that it's of the past, that it's been abolished, that the Messiah came to destroy the law. It doesn't say that. He came to fulfill the law for us and also in us. See, the law comprises not just of death and curse. Messiah, because he was hung on the tree, the Torah says, cursed is the one who hung on the tree. He took the curse. What happened to him on the tree? He died. See, Moses says, I set before you the Torah, both life and death, blessing and curse. Yeshua, on the cross, he became a curse. He died. He did that for us in order that the life and the blessings of the law could become our reality. So anyone that says that it's been abolished, that he's removed it, they haven't read the scripture. The scripture doesn't say that. It says that he took the curse and the death in order that the life and the blessing we can have through him as well. Everything that good he is a mediator of. So here, Paul is saying that Moses, when, when he gave the law, when he came down from the mountain of God, that's where he received the commandments. So all the context, the mountain of God, the glory, all of this is to esteem the law. It is glorious. Many people, they struggle with that, that concept. The law is good. It is holy. That's what Paul says, Romans chapter 7. He also says that the law emitted glory. What type of glory? Well, it's this same word, kat argeo. That glory that, that dissipates, that glory that becomes less, that is going to disappear, that is going to become obsolete. 
because it's going to be replaced. But that which replaces it, it not only defines like the Torah did righteousness in that same way. It, it receives that definition of righteousness, but here's the difference. It mediates righteousness to us, that is, through the gospel, the ministry of Messiah, the standards of righteousness. He mediates to us that I, by his grace, by his work, I receive the righteousness of Messiah placed upon me that God sees his righteousness when he looks at me praise him secondly the work of the spirit is going to produce a righteous conduct why those who walk not in the flesh but in the spirit they fulfill the righteousness of the law don't be like many here in Israel I'm speaking about many believers that they take that verse and they purposely with malice for the text, they change it and say that, that through the Spirit, we fulfill the standards of the law. That word is never standards. It's the word for righteousness. Why do they translate it this way? Because they did not want to associate righteousness in the law. The Bible does repeatedly. Paul does, but they didn't want to because it does not fit the, the mindset of the missionaries that led them to faith. We need to be very, very careful with what we share, that we do so based upon the authority of the text. Verse, verse 13, he says, And not as Moses, who set a veil over his face, because of the children of Israel not looking upon the end of what was fading away. And that's what it literally says. I want to translate it again. Verse 13. And not as Moses, that he set a veil over or upon his own face, before the children of Israel, so not to gaze to the end of what was passing by, that which was fading, that which was becoming obsolete. Now, Moses here, in what Paul is saying, we learned something about Moses from Paul. Moses it was because of, if you read the first part of this chapter, it was because of the glory of the law, not the glory of God. The glory of God does not fade away, does not dissipate, does not become obsolete. So it's the glory of the law. It was reflected from Moses' face these rays that, that shot out. But what was happening? He says, Moses put a veil so the children of Israel would not gaze and see that, that the end would be fading away, that it was not permanent. Why? Because he wanted to focus upon the message and not simply the, the glory, the fading glory that was attached to the law, but the message of the law. Keep reading verse 14. But their thoughts, this has to do, it's a word for perspective. And in this case, it shows that they had a wrong perspective. They were infatuated with just looking at this glory. But what was happening to this glory? It was becoming less. It was fading away. It was going to become obsolete. And therefore, Paul did not want them to focus in on this, in quoting what Moses did. Moses did not want them to focus in on this, so he put a veil over it. And therefore, he says, look now to, to verse 14, but... Their thoughts 
were hardened. For until today, meaning this hardened hearts, was, was even until this day, from the time of Moses unto the time of Paul, and nothing has changed. For until this day, the same veil is over the reading of the, the Old Covenant. Now, the term here, Old Covenant or Old Testament, depending upon how your Bible translates this Greek word, same meaning, just two different words in the English language, but it refers to a covenant. And what, what Paul is saying is this. Even today, when the people read the, the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, what's commonly referred to as the older covenant, that veil is still there. They don't see things properly as they should with the proper understanding. Now, here's the message. The reason why the glory of the Torah dissipates, becomes less, fades, and will become obsolete, is becoming obsolete. The reason is something is greater that's on the horizon that the letters point to. And that is the Messiah points to his death for us. So Paul did not want them to focus in on this fading glory, but on the word itself. What is said, God's purpose is his will, what the Torah reveals. But the problem is, he says, that same veil that obscures what God, how he gave the Torah, why he gave the Torah, the true glory of the Torah, he says, that same veil still obscures what? He says, the reading of the Old Covenant. That veil still remains and is not lifted up. Why? There's only one way to remove it. And that is, he says, which is in Messiah. It is removed. It is literally, it fades away. Now, what fades away? That veil. It's only through Messiah that we can rightly understand why that glory is fading and why there would no longer be a need for the veil. And therefore, when the Word of God, the Older Covenant, the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, when it's read, and what is in Messiah, he can see the revelation of that, that Scripture and its purpose, what the Scripture points to. That's what he's saying in this, this passage. Now let's look at, at verse, verse 15. But until this day, whenever Moses is read, the veil is upon their hearts having been laid. Now, this is important because having been laid, meaning something has caused it to be there. And that is a wrong understanding of the glory. Let me tell you how this is manifested today. It's manifested by the thought that the Torah is eternal. It is not. I said last week, and I received many comments over this, this statement in emails. People were angered by that statement. The Torah is not eternal. I told them, as I did in this discussion, yes, Judaism sees the Torah as eternal, but the Word of God does not. There is coming a time when there's not going to be any future temple. Today, there is going to be a temple in the millennial kingdom. The, Lord, the Torah is going to have great relevance, as I said last week. Messiah will rule the justice, the righteousness that he will 
rule over, maintain in the millennial kingdom will be based upon the revelation of the Torah. It will fulfill that. But there's a greater, greater manifestation of his kingdom. And that is the new Jerusalem. And there, there will be no temple. The Torah is not eternal. And that is why the glory of the Torah dissipates, is fading away. And we see what Paul manifests here is what he says earlier. When he writes, look at the end of verse 14. He says, uh, uh, it remains uh, not uncovered, not removed, because it's only removed in Messiah. Verse 15. But even today, now when Moses is read, Moses is referring to the law of Moses. It says the veil is upon their hearts laid. But now, look now to verse 16. But when, and he's speaking about that moment now, when one should turn, and this is a word for repentance. There's two words for repentance in the New Covenant. The word metanoia and this word. And this is the word strepho. But here we have a, a preposition, epistrepo, which means to turn to. Not just turning, but a specific turning to. And the implication is this. When one, whenever one should turn to the Lord. Now, it doesn't say Yeshua, but that's who he's speaking about. But it's very important. I share with you one of the hermeneutical devices that help us understand, interpret the word of God is to always pay attention to how Messiah is being spoken of, whether it's by his name or some title, whether it's savior, whether it's teacher, whether it's Lord, as in this case. So whenever one turns to Yeshua and recognizes, and this is his intent, recognizes the Lordship of Messiah, then what happens? Well, then we see something. We see that the veil is removed. And what's interesting is the word order. It's emphasized the removal is what's emphasized. Of the veil so the emphasis is not on the veil but the removing of the veil verse 17 and and what brings us about this removal of the veil well it's faith in Messiah him being the Lord of your life but notice what it says in this short verse verse 17 but the Lord is spirit now, here it's saying that Messiah, being in him, having that new covenant relationship, this lordship of Yeshua manifests itself out with the spirit, his spirit, entering into you. And it's through his spirit that change, great change, transformation, marvelous transformation takes place in a person's life. And as I say, the Spirit of God, we could say the Spirit of Yeshua, same Spirit, only one, the Holy Spirit. When He enters into a person's life, that Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Yeshua, He brings a kingdom order to our life. And that's what He's going to speak about. Keep reading. But the Lord, he is spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord, and the implication is where there is the spirit of the Lord, there, and that's emphatic, wherever the spirit of the Lord is, there is, and here's a very important word. Your Bible may translate it with the word liberty or freedom. Now, there's nothing wrong with, with however that word is rendered, whether it's liberty or freedom. It's a great word. 
That's what the Spirit, He gives to us, liberty and freedom. But here's the problem. The problem is how people understand this freedom and liberty. Many people believe, now I have been liberated, I am free to do what I want. No. Heresy. It is liberty and being set free to become the servants of God. That's why Messiah is spoken of here as Lord. Not simply saying he's the Savior. He is, of course, the Savior, the only Savior. There's no salvation by any other one, only in him and his name, Yeshua, Jesus, Jesus, whatever language you speak. But the purpose is the same, and that is to reflect God's order, his will, his purposes, to do his plan. And the Holy Spirit, he gives us the ability, he sets us free. He brings about the change in our life where we have been liberated to serve God, to to do his will, to walk in righteousness. That's what he's saying. Verse 18. Now, verse 18, our last verse. But what an important one. And one that we need to spend a little bit of time on, extra time, because it summarizes the whole purpose of this third chapter. So let's begin. We'll take it very slowly. We read at the beginning of verse 18, but we all. Now that phrase, but we all, and the word here, but, the reason why I translated it this way is because it shows a contrast with all of humanity, the rest of humanity. So here, Paul is speaking when he says all, He's talking about all believers. That's why he says we and not just all every human being. So he says, but all of us, we all. So he's sharing something that is a common. When I say common, it means that every believer shares in this. It is the normal experience for everyone who has truly been saved. And what is that experience? Well, once more, verse 18. But we all, and it's a word for not having a veil upon the face. So we have been individuals that that veil has been removed. That shouldn't surprise us. He told us earlier in verse verse 16 that in Messiah, the veil is removed. So he says, but we all, have shared in that experience. We all have that common, common transformation where we see things properly because the veil has been removed. The glory, because of that, the glory of the Lord, His glory. The glory of the Lord, what happens is now by us, through us, is now being reflected. Now, some Bibles will will bring into the translation the word mirror. Well, a mirror is simply a place that you see the reflection. So the word mirror and the word reflection has the same, same meaning. So it's just smoother and easier in the way that we speak today and not the way they spoke during the time that the King James was translated that we use the word which captures the meaning of the original Greek word for reflection. So now, by means of the liberty that that I have received through the sufficiency of the work of Messiah, by means of the reception of the Holy Spirit, now I, now you, every believer, that veil has been removed We see things clearly, and therefore we can reflect properly, what? The glory of God. Now, this really teaches us the the definition of a disciple. A disciple is one that reflects the glory of God. 
And that glory is a kingdom glory. You look at the scripture, and I'm speaking specifically of, of Zechariah chapter 14. It speaks of the kingdom of God and a unique light. The same light when, when, when God says in Genesis 1, Vayahi, or let there be light, it was a unique light. It was a glorious light because the sun, the moon, the stars, natural light wasn't created until the fourth day. So look again of this such a significant scripture. But, but we all, we are without a veil upon our face. It's been removed. Why? That the glory of the Lord that we should be reflecting that that same image now this is a word that speaks it's it's related to the word icon and an icon in the technical sense is when you make a for example a coin normally coins were carved out of wood and then they were what, what a cast or a mold was made around that word, word carving. And the first one that came out, because with time, impurities, imperfections happen and such. So they would bring out the very first one that was cast, that was made from that mold, and they would compare it with the original. That's called the icon. It was an exact replica of, of the same. Now, that word was used to speak about, to speak about us. That we were supposed to reflect. We do not emit. We're not divine. We will never be divine. But we have the calling to reflect that same glory. Not the glory that fades from the law, but the glory of the Spirit. The Spirit of God, He is going to be reflected through our service, our work. That's what He's saying. We don't have a veil on, and that veil is two ways. First of all, it doesn't conceal any of God's revelation. And secondly, we're not concealed. We're not like Moses who covered up because the glory that Moses demonstrated was a glory that was becoming less, that was fading away, that would become obsolete, the glory of the law. No, our glory is of the Spirit, the very Spirit of Messiah. So he says here, the same image we have been changed. This is a word, the Greek word metamorphosis. That's where we get that word. It's the same word, just pronounced metamorphia. So we look at it, we are being changed. Changed by who? The Spirit. Changed how? He says here, from glory unto glory. Just as from the, the Spirit of the Lord. Now, this is how he summarizes. We are being transformed. We're going through a metamorphosis. That's exactly the term that he uses here. Metamorphometha. Metha is the first person plural suffix. So it's a word metamorphosis. That same, same glory. We are being transformed. We are being changed into from glory unto glory, just as from. And what's the source of our glory? He tells us. It is not the Torah. The Torah is good. The Torah teaches us what is right and what is wrong. It is holy, but it is not an instrument of change. The Torah tells me my desperate and absolute need to change because it reveals the standards of God's God's righteous standards that I fall short from 
So that glory doesn't remain. It gives away. It is becoming obsolete, but there's still a relevance in this age. And there will be even a greater relevance in the millennial kingdom. But after the millennial kingdom, that glory will not be seen. Because we're going to go, just like we're supposed to demonstrate, from glory to glory. And the glory that we're called to to reflect is the glory of the Spirit of Yeshua. But here again, doesn't say Yeshua, although that's who he's speaking of, but Yeshua is called the Lord. Why? It is only when we are recognizing, not just in thought, but in deed. We're not saved by our deeds, but having been saved, our deeds are called to reflect the glory of God. And it's only through His Spirit, when we recognize and submit to His Lordship, are we going to see that glory, that kingdom glory being produced. That is our call as disciples. And so, so unfortunate today, that people don't know. When God looks at us, His expectations for us is that we are temples of the Holy Spirit, therefore instruments that are called. He demands that we reflect His glory. So I'll close with this. Are you reflecting the glory of Messiah Yeshua? Shalom from Israel.